this and we can get going. Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Jo Palmer. For those of you who I haven't met before, it's good to see some familiar names and faces in the, in the chat this morning. Um, I'm the founder and managing director of Pointer Remote. So we are a company that is really passionate about um, supporting businesses and individuals all over Australia, but in particular in rural areas to really leverage remote work to either grow your business or to um, access the job market, but also working with, um, with communities so that how communities can um, leverage remote work to attract and retain population, to um, increase economic development in their area as well. So um, this is um, part of our Ask Me Anything series that we are running with pros in the area as far as remote work. And I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Bailey Bosch this morning. Um, I will let Bailey introduce herself, but look, Bailey and I have known each other for some time now. Bailey's based um, in Western Australia and is a very clever chook. Um, <laughs> so I've got a pile of questions that um, I want to ask you as well and some questions that came from people as they registered. And like I said, if you've got any further questions that um, come up as we're going along, feel free to put them in the chat and I can ask Bailey. So Bailey, give us your your elevator pitch on you and life and all the stuff. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, really lovely to be here. Thanks very much for asking me. I think it's obviously a fantastic time in history to talk about this stuff, but also it's such an important topic. So really um, privileged to be here. So thank you. Right. About me. So in the work capacity, I'm a psychologist. So I really sort of I come at the remote work or just work life in general, really from a sort of well-being point of view, as well as a very practical point of view. I think sometimes in psychology, we can kind of get left behind in the theory and, and not actually move into the real world. So that's really important for me. I think we have the, the theory and the evidence and the understanding, but it has to work in the real world. So, yes, yeah, so psychologist, um, with a interest and a specialty in uh, remote work and sort of figuring out how we can best place people into remote work. So what are the sort of personality characteristics? What are the uh, traits that are needed to make it that a successful transition? Unreal. And this topic that we're talking um, around today, around this concept of a work like blend, I love the word blend rather than juggle. And um, I think that that, really is is key to what some of the things that we're going to talk about today um you really are a pro not only at like the psychology side of things but as far as the the work-life blend um bailey is 32 weeks pregnant with her sixth child so <laughs> this girl knows what she's talking about so as far as um asking me anything i'm sure bailey would be really happy to answer questions around what that looks like as far as um running your own business very busy household um and doing all of those things so um do you want me to kick us off with a question or is there something that you wanted to highlight before we kick off no no i'm happy to get stuck straight in okay fabo so the first thing that I, um, like I said, I get to have my questions first. So the first thing that I really wanted to talk about was um, what do you see um, are some of the biggest challenges from working remotely, be that from home, a co-working space or somewhere other than a traditional office setup um, from a mental health wellbeing point of view? So what, are, what do you think are the really important, well, the challenges, but then the responses and strategies and stuff around that? Okay, so there's a few parts to it. I think definitely a key component is our brains are really structured to go around cues and environments and understanding where we are and what we're supposed to do in those places. And generally, once you take somebody out of an office or out of a, a typical professional environment, and say it's back at home or it might be in a co-working space. Co-working space is possibly a little bit different, but let's just say um, we're talking mainly about home. What we have there is we don't have the surrounding environment to support that mental transition into the next role. 
So we're sitting in a place that what we, we really would think of it as a domestic sphere, but we're now suddenly expected to act in a professional capacity. I think that is a, a key thing that sometimes we dismiss the environment and the importance of, of the physical environment around us. Also, for some people, the social support of being in a group setting, whether you're in a shared office or not, knowing that there's people around or you're part of a bigger picture, that can really make an impact in terms of the, the feelings of isolation and loneliness. And even um, people can start to question their competency because they think, well, there's nobody here to check on me. There's nobody here I can sort of use as a stopgap. How do I actually know that what I'm doing is correct? It, you know, if you've got long, um, long, periods of time between check-ins with managers, for example. So those kind of thoughts can creep in as well. Am I even doing the right work? Am I doing the right thing? Um, and then of course, you know, let's just put in the, the actual reality of it. Some people don't want to work like that. And particularly in, in recent months, it's, if it's been forced on onto workers, that brings a whole other, you know, set of problems especially when you then add into the mix family at home and like um, you know you've, you've mentioned before we started recording having to share workspaces with perhaps your partner who's also working from home so it, it's quite a, a multifaceted um, a, a situation to really sort of pull the, bit, the bits and pieces apart from it Mm. so well going straight on that so that i'm uh, touching on that point where you talked about that that sort of almost that you're you're in what is traditionally your domestic side of brain slash life have you got any um i don't know little tips or hacks for people that can help with that transition i know a lot of the um individuals and organizations that we've been dealing with over COVID-19, but also prior to that, is that how do you transition from work to home when you're doing this this thing, this remote work thing? Like, have you got any tips about how um, people can sort of put some boundaries around mm. it or, um, yeah, make that transition between the two, I suppose, more of a solid line so that life doesn't blur into work and vice versa? Yeah. Okay, so again, the realities of everyday life have to come into this. So there's certainly the tips and the tricks, but that doesn't always mean it translates into the real world. Again, for example, you can have um, boundaries in place, you can have set work hours, you can have a part of the house that's dedicated to this, and you can do all these other little bits and pieces that we can talk about. But if you've got very young children at home, well, it, it's kind of too bad, you know, that those boundaries aren't always um, maintained or it's very, it becomes very stressful to maintain those. So there's also the flip side of the pressure people put on themselves to really have these strong boundaries. Everybody's saying you need boundaries. That's how you can demark the different roles that you're doing throughout the day. But also we need to sort of cut ourselves a bit of slack because you cannot always maintain the boundaries when you've got especially young children at home and you're trying to um you, you know you've you've got no other options but to have them to have them there under your care at the time you're trying to work so that in that having having said that that in mind there are as i said environmental things that you can sort of tweak to try and get your um identity to shift into the the different roles so um for example, if you did have a place of work in the house, that would be really excellent if it stayed as that place. So not moving the laptop around with you and taking it onto the couch or putting it in the kitchen or, um, you, you know, sometimes you'll have to. For example, I have done a whole lot of work sitting in the trampoline because my two-year-old can't fall out of the trampoline. So I sit in there with the, the net around us. Um, sometimes you'll have to do it, but if you can stay in one place, keep that environment set up that as you go in there, those cues, those environmental cues are saying to your, your, um, your, your cognitive system, this is work, this is the role that we're going to do now. It also could help if um, there's, again, playing on the environmental thing, if there's something that you can do physically, so for example, uh, I think um, I've mentioned this in some of the tips that you've put out through your newsletters. Go to you can't you can't leave work if you don't go to work. So have some kind of ritual around going to work. So I've worked with people who will go out their front door, walk to the letterbox, 
pretend they've come in to, a, to start a day's work and sit down at their desk and do you know a couple of hours of work. When work's finished, there's a sort of ritual of that. It might be, you know, pack away some papers, shut down the laptop, something in the environment that triggers to you, it's work's finished now. And also in and of yourself, you could put on p perhaps a work jacket or change the different, you know, if you wear glasses, put your different glasses on. Um, just trying to manipulate your environment. Another really great one is to put shoes on. So, you know, barefoot, being barefoot signalize, uh, signals and, or symbolizes relaxation, sitting on the couch, pulling, you know, putting your feet up, sitting back. And, and again, especially if you're sitting with a laptop on the couch and then you sit there and you put, put your feet up and suddenly you're lying back on a pillow and oh, you know, should really be doing this. And it's so much um, more tempting to watch Bluey and just pay attention to the kids. Put your shoes on because putting feet on the couch with shoes on becomes a lot more difficult. And it just puts you in that frame of mind of, okay, this is work now. And I'm trying to make some superficial boundaries as best I can to sort of mark out professional and personal. Yeah, that's so good. I was um, talking to um, a friend of mine who she, when she clocks off, she puts the apron on. And that's also a signal to the kids as well. So the apron yeah. being on means, okay, I've got mum mum hat on now. You can come and ask me questions. You mm. can, uh, you, I can actually engage and, and work is finished now. Um, that's some really, I think some really good tips because that I feel can be a challenge um, when you're not physically, and especially if you don't have the, the privilege, I guess, of having a home office where you can mm. shut the door and leave work. Um, I think that whole concept, though, of packing the laptop down, moving it to the side. I've got another friend that actually will lie a tea towel over all of the work at the end of the mm. kitchen bench. So you're not yeah. physically looking at it. And that temptation to jump back into work doesn't happen um, later as well. So that's an interesting one. Thank you. The, just, just, to, just to add, there's a couple, of, a couple of points there as well. Kids respond so well to this. If you think about it from a kid's point of view, it's a very obvious, um, and especially we spend a lot of our time on our phones for recreation or, you know, looking at iPads, watching shows. They don't always know that when you're on a device, you're working. So to make it very clear and make it as easy as possible for kids to understand, visual, visual cues work excellent. Um, you know, they, they really respond to that. Uh, and the other thing as well, I love the idea of the tea towel over the uh, work stuff because often we are doing work amongst the rest of the house. If you actually wanted to get serious about this, you could set yourself up a bit of a timesheet and every time you go sit down at that laptop, so you have, you know, like the kids um, chore chart, for example, you start writing on there, okay, sat down now, 10, 15, got up or whatever time it was. And I think a lot of people would be staggered at how much time extra they're spending working than they would if they were in a sort of more uh, structured traditional work day. Employers fear remote work because they worry that their employees aren't going to do the task. They think they're going to slack off. Generally, what we find, it's the complete opposite. We have burnout from people who are working from home, people who are um, working remotely because we lack that structure. The, the clock doesn't mean as much as it does when you're at home compared to when you're in a workplace. Physically, things change. Other people start leaving. Outside starts getting busier as people start exiting offices and heading towards trains or whatever. You start to see all of this stuff. When you're at home, the temptation is, well, I need to do this work. Let me just do it. And the burnout risk is actually higher for people working at home um, compared to those in an office. So if you could set up some kind of timesheet, just keep an eye on how much you're working because you certainly don't want to add burnout to all of the, you know, the rest of the stuff that's going on. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. We were talking offline about it. I had a very similar situation when we first started lockdown and I work remotely. I've run my company remotely from the start. Like I'm, I'm used to doing this. I run workshops on how to do this, but those boundaries for myself had generally still, I had like daycare and preschool and school pickups and things that still put some physical boundaries around my day. But when those were removed, I, I worked out that I'd gained 10 and a half hours a week that I wasn't driving from the farm into town 
to bus to piano to ballet to all of these things and instead of doing something nice like read a book or go for a walk or actually hang out with my children um, I found that I was doing another 10 and a half hours of work a week and it I, I burnt myself out during COVID like it was exhausting that I'd stuck I'd snuck another whole more than a day's worth of work into a week yeah and um yeah it just it, it those boundaries weren't there so um I very much have started doing a lot more of these these visual cues and like you said the kids have really reacted well to that as well because they they know they know never to come into the office when the door's shut but also they um are then like okay mum's back on now when I I come downstairs and um yeah the shoe's on is a really good one as well mm. i think it also puts it, it it makes it clearer to you as well because you have to live up to that those expectations of the kids you are now in mum mode so because of that it helps you switch off as well mm. because you can't you know you sort of owe it to them yep you've done the right thing while i've asked you to you know stay out when the doors shut etc cetera, etc cetera. And now I'm, I'm suggesting to you that I'm, I'm, I'm on like family duty and it stops you then just, oh, I'll just dash back and quickly finish something because you, you, your kids are occupied for 10 minutes. I think it really helps discipline us as, uh, us as parents, as, as um, family members to turn off. That's it. You've, you've told the kids, you've told the family that you're off duty. They're going to hold you to account. Mm, yeah, 100%, 100%. Okay, another question for you. Is there a difference when you have more time and opportunity to plan your work-life blend versus being thrown into it like what's happened with the pandemic? Mm. Do you think that if you could rewind the clock six months, okay, let's do that. Rewind the clock six months pre-pandemic, what is the sort of advice that you're giving either business owners or individuals who are doing this remote work thing for the first time or transitioning to this or doing it in a in a hybrid way what are the sorts of advice that you give to people when they're not doing it like our poor victorian friends are doing at the moment and back into that lockdown situation yeah okay if there was no um if there was no COVID, again there would be an, a, a different answer given that we're saying that we're coming into a pandemic what can we uh, tell people what can we change it's really around the expectation management working from home isn't the same as working in an office but you're just doing it from home and i think that is really a key point to remember again the, the saying gets thrown around quite a bit that it's actually not business as usual it's not work isn't the same but it's just done from a different location that's a complete um, you know, let's not buy into that. When you buy into that, you have the same expectations of your output, your productivity, your your um, effectiveness in your role. You bring it into an environment at home where you've got children at home, you've got the stress of, you know, perhaps you, you have elderly parents or relatives that you can't go and visit. There's a million other things you add into the mix, but you're still expected to work as you were in an office environment in a normal, um, you know, in a, in a normal period of history. We, we need um, employers to understand that, but we also need the workers themselves to understand that. And that's not just of their own, their, their expectations of themselves, but it's expectations of team members as well. It gets also very difficult when you start adding in the combination of people who don't have children, for example, or uh, people who don't have especially in the, the real height of the lockdown, some people found a lot of solace in their work and they really hammered it. They, they overworked to sort of keep themselves occupied. You then put that against a, a team member who physically cannot, they've got children at home, they're supposed to be doing homeschooling, they're supposed to be doing their work or they've got very young children that need physical, um, physical care. It's not always it's not always compatible people's expectations. So I think from, if you were going into it with a bit more planning and preparation, it would be really spending the time communicating what their expectations are. And also people being honest and open about what they can and can't do. I think sometimes, um, you know, especially as, as mums, we think, we don't want people to think that we're not capable or we don't want to feel that, you know, we don't want to jeopardize our career prospects by suggesting we've got any kind of weakness or we've got any kind of, um, you know, propensity to be overwhelmed. No, 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 we can handle it. We can do it. And so you go into these situations with these massive expectations on yourself. You don't speak up. So people think, oh, well, 
you, you must be handling it. You're still doing the output. You're still doing all the bits and pieces of your job that you're supposed to, but they don't see behind the scenes. You know, you're, for, you're physically falling apart. You're emotionally, socially, everything is, is heading towards burnout and, and absolute overwhelm. The relationships with your children are getting strained, your, your family relationships. So we have to be honest about expectations. I think if you were coming into this with a bit more planning and, and um, for, forewarning, that is where I would focus on. Mm. So with that in mind, if you then, um, we picture a post-COVID world where um, we'll look from, from our experience, what we're seeing um, at Pointer with a lot of the organisations we work with, with a lot of the individuals we work with, what we are seeing is that a lot of organisations are seeing this as, okay, that was really intense and really hardcore and that's not how we would have done this in a perfect world. But in a perfect world, let's be honest, we didn't even consider it beforehand. But we're seeing so many organisations that are seeing that there were some real positives from this and there were silver linings and there were things. And so moving forward, they really do plan to integrate some of these things into into what the new like business as usual looks like for these organizations have you got any advice for individuals well and business owners we've got both um both people watching um watching this say to start with for individuals advice on um I guess negotiating with organisations or um, sort of what could they be doing to almost cherry pick the bits that were good and, and then present that as a can this now be how my life or my work looks? Like have you got any advice on how to sort of negotiate that or to, to get that sort of clear? Mm. I think what you say is absolutely correct. Some organisations that would never in a million years have considered this as a, a, a um, feasible way of working and have now really had their eyes open to the benefits of it. So there's obviously the commercial um, the commercial side of it. So in terms of presenting your case, if, if, that, if I've understood the question correctly, presenting the case to your organisation, for example, if you want to start working more in a remote or um, flexible capacity, absolutely the key place to start is the commercial argument. Mm -hmm. And that really centres on, well, we've shown you that we don't need to have that expensive office place space. We don't need to be taking up that seat. Again, there's the, you know, the sustainability argument as well. It's better for the environment. People aren't commuting. They're not having to heat and cool and, and do all the um, electricity and, and power, et cetera, with the office places. Let us work from home. So there's, there's certainly that commercial aspect, especially if an organization has had a good experience with, um, you know, the, the corona, um, for the forced remote working from um, a corona point of view. Just also to add there, some places have had an awful experience and they're going to now go forward saying, well, it's because of remote work or it's because of working from home. Absolutely not. It is from simply not being prepared, not planning. And in some senses as well, and this is, I suppose, where a lot of my work focuses on, you don't have the right people in the right jobs. So, again, coming to the, the question about from an individual's point of view, just be 100% sure that this is how you like to work. If it's flexibility you're after, it's not necessarily um, a requirement that you work from home. Sometimes we can be tempted thinking, well, if I could just work from home, I'll solve my, you know, whatever the stressor is. It's not always the location of work either. So don't think that just because you work from home, you'll solve, or, you know, it's a golden ticket. Flexibility can come in many, many different forms and it isn't focused on just where you work. So from an organization's point of view and an individual's point of view, know yourself, know exactly what the problem you're trying to solve is, because until you do that, you can sometimes band-aid over situations. If you don't actually get to the nut of what the problem is, um, it can seem really tempting. Oh, well, if I could just work from home, that would that would fix everything. Same from an organization's point of view. You know, if we could just get people working from home, we could save money. Well, yes, you might, but then you might have more problems in management. You might have more problems in, in performance management um, and, and productivity and output. So that could be a false economy as well. 
key message would be if you're going into this in a, in a structured and planned way, which wasn't possible um, you know, before the pandemic, but now we're looking to the future, really start thinking about it and giving a deep analysis on what type of jobs can be done remotely or flexibly, but also which type of, uh, what people would best suit those particular positions. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because I think um, I think you've hit the nail on the head there that that band-aid of thinking that it actually could be underlying communication issues or management styles not working with how someone works and that just if I think if I'm moving the removing myself from the physical situation that communication may magically magically improve or um, yeah, that's really interesting. I've just got a question here. Um, what are the mental adjustments, oh, sorry, mental adjustment issues for those forced by COVID to work at home, but then having to return to the office back to normal? So that, that transition when like, okay, right, we're all back in now. Um, yeah, what are the, the, the adjustment issues that come mm. with that? So almost pretending that it never happened and let's just come back in. Mm. Well, I think key to it is acknowledging that there is an adjustment period. So there's, it's never going to be just a smooth, all right, let's flick the switch now, we're all just back, um, back into work, especially when you add into the um, equation the anxiety some people feel. Some people don't want to go back into a workplace from, from a health point of view, especially if they have to commute um, in public transport or they might feel that they're their workplace doesn't allow for adequate social distancing. You then add anxiety or health anxiety into that mix. So absolutely there is mental adjustment that's required. From a, from a point of view of trying to find, I, I suppose the, the benefit of it, if you can perhaps think what it, what it is you are going to miss from working from home or working flexibly, but what you're also going to gain or benefit from working back in an office. And if you can give yourself a little bit of a, a time to reflect on that and say, all right, well, some of the best things were and whatever they were, how can you build that into your everyday working life? So it might be, for example, that, um, you know, if you take the reverse of it, you might've overworked when you were at home. So as you're going back into the workplace and you're trying to make that adjustment is being mindful and open to, well, there's actually some positives here. And the positive is once I turn up at, you know, at nine o'clock, whatever it is, I'm working and then generally, and it's something we should aim for when I leave at, you know, five, whatever, that's me done for the day. That's a really positive. And that will require some mental adjustment too, if you're used to somebody who's, worked at any sort of patch of time they could just to get things done because that was how you had to work at home. Um, yeah, so if you can keep some kind of reflection um, list going, what can you take from the best of the experience and from the worst of the experience, what can you try, how can you try and adjust your working life and your home life to try and negate those negative experiences? Mm. And I guess that that list can also become something um, that maybe you get back into that office five days a week or whatever that looks like. If you're making notes on these things and reflecting and actually drilling down into that um, really honestly, that, that can be something that you take to your manager or your boss and say like, look, this is, is there some way we can negotiate a hybrid model where I'm in mm. a couple of days a week, some days from home, like these are the real positives that I saw. I found I was really productive when I got up at, 5am, did my yoga, went for a walk, got up, knocked out um, an hour, hour and a half of work um, before the kids got up. And is there some way that I could be, be doing that? Or is it, like you said, not all flexibility has to be remote. It might be that you actually adjust your work hours and that that actually becomes a 10 a.m. into the office and leaving at a later time or keeping your, your leaving time the same, but you're doing more um, hours before you go into work. I think that's a really interesting point. I really and like that. Oh, sorry. There you go. I was just going to say, if you want to look at a sort of umbrella approach to the question around mental adjustment, we're really talking about resilience training. So when, when you go back to work, as we've seen, there's, poss there's a possibility you might have to go back home again. We might be back into the lockdown situation. So it's really, it's really an absolute um, period of time when resilience is coming forward as one of the sort of protective or the 
the, the golden skills that we really need to have during this time. So, it, and it feeds really nicely into the question around mental adjustment. So the really good news about resilience, of course, is that anybody can learn it. It's not a talent. It, some people you can say, oh, you know, that they're, they're a real tough cookie. They were born that way. Well, perhaps, but also um, the evidence really tells us that you can train in resilience. So resilience being a muscle, being a skill that you can develop. Everybody can benefit from some resilience training during this time because, yes, you might make the mental adjustment to go back into your workplace, but should you be sent back home again, you really need that, that flexibility, that agility in your own thinking, in your own emotional response to be able to cope with whatever, the, you know, whatever this year is going to throw at us that's you know, yet to be seen. If you can work on your resilience, it gives you a lovely protective, uh, a safeguard against, regard, you know, regardless if you're going back home, you're going into the workplace, those adjustments become a lot, a lot smoother if you've built up your resilience. Yeah, and I guess that that, um, that that list that you're collated as far as the positives and that, that can almost be a reference point to refer back to, I guess, as well. So that's, yeah, yeah. that's a really interesting point. Um, motivation to work and not being easily distracted by social media, sunshine, dogs and kids, how do you stay on track? Do you set, um, do you use a time, time tracking, work, like work for 50, uh, 30 minutes, relax for 10 minutes or things? What are the, what are your hacks around actually managing your time and managing actually like um, to get something done? Mm. Okay. So, firstly, I like to think of why I'm not motivated. No. So, if you can take it back one step, um, one step before you get to this, oh, I'm not motivated. Well, why is it? Is it? Is there a particular reason that I'm putting off this task? What will it mean when this task gets completed? Or what will it mean if I don't complete this task? So, there's always there's always the understory of why you're not doing something. Um, so yeah, if you can if you can really sort of try figure out well, why don't I want to do this particular task? If there's something that you really don't want to do, but it's essential to your everyday job or or just running of your life, it always helps if you can get that done first. You know that that sort of um, and that's a very you know common thing that people suggest knock that thing off first so that you kind of get it out the way so it's not hanging over your head and and tarnishing all the rest of your um, the rest of your day in terms of um of motivation as well you have to also you have to realize that motivation isn't enough it, you, you can't rely on motivation to get things done because if you do you'll be sitting there for the rest of your life waiting sometimes motivation just simply will not come so it's it's i, I like to think of if you start a day, instead of having a goal for the day, you have a rule for the day. So goals, you can kind of change around and you can play around with them and, oh, well, I don't actually want to do that anymore, so I'm going to adjust the goal. And you, always, you almost think of a goal as something you need to be motivated to do. If you forget about having a goal, but you just say the rules for today are... And then it might be like you say, if I if I work for one hour, I can relax for half an hour. But that is a inflexible rule that once you do it, you don't you, you what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove we're very we're very lucky that we've got this brain that can think and can change and can um, you know have free will, but it's an absolute pain in the bum sometimes. So you need to work how you can master work with trying to master that brain to say, look, there's no option here. If you go to a traffic light and it's red, you stop, end of story. I don't have to keep thinking about it. It's not even an issue. Very much like parenting in some in some senses, you know, everybody knows what they can tolerate and they won't they won't tolerate. So there's the, the the nagging factor that eventually you'll give in and say, fine, fine, you know, just like what did I have yesterday? Um wanted two packets of, of cough lozenges of all things at this at the checkout and having this absolute carry-on. Fine, you have the cough lozenges. But if it was something like, you know, I want to go across the road, um, cross the road by myself and I'm two years old. End of story. No, the rule is you're not doing that. Try and make it as easy as possible for yourself to stick to it. And when you start to call it a rule, 
it becomes really easy. It's not, it's not open for negotiation. I have to do my work between, I don't know, again, you've got to work around what's practical with kids at home. Um, you know, between 11 and 12, that's when I'm working in a story. And it gets to 11 o'clock. Yep, I know this is the rule for the day. I'm not, it's not a goal. I'm not aiming to have done two hours before lunchtime. It's just a rule. I have to, I have to do it before lunchtime. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the tracking of, or the, the time tracking, there's some, there's some sort of evidence as well that if you can bunch tasks that are similar, you can get them done. And the, the success on the first task leads to um, that feeling that sort of positive reinforcement that you continue on with those tasks. So depending on the type of work you do, if you can kind of batch the, the tasks that are similar, at least get one or two done, then it builds a bit of momentum um, in tasks that are, are very similar and you're not requiring that cognitive switch between two different types of thinking or, or two different, um, you know, it's, some stuff's very easygoing admin or others is deeper level work that requires a lot more thinking. Try, try um, batch them together. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm really loving the concept of calling it a rule. I like, I think you've just changed my life with, mm. with, that, <laughs> with that comment there. I think that that's something that I'm very much um, guilty of. And I'm really good at planning, at organising and things. But you're right, our brain is so good of giving, at giving us get out of jail free cards. Like, oh, but you did such a great job at that. So, you know what, let's just leave that till tomorrow and you put that on there. But making it a rule, like the um, just the terminology around it, I think that's a really, really interesting strategy. I like that. Thank you. Well, well I think, important. you know, it, it comes back to the environmental cue. Sometimes we can dismiss the simple things and we're trying to chase these amazing, you know, solutions and strategies. But sometimes it's very simple things like changing the word that it's just a rule or um, putting your shoes on because this is what a normal working person at a desk would wear. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into, a, into my workplace with my my bed socks on. So it, sometimes we can dismiss the simple things because we're, we're sort of chasing them all. It must be better because it's complicated. Well, not always. Yeah, really, that's really interesting. Um, what are some of the tools or systems that you use to help you stay in control of multiple responsibilities? So all the hats mm. that you wear. Right, great question because when I hear that, question it makes me think of adding stuff to my already busy life you know what apps can i put up what systems can i learn you know it's that to me sounds like hard work underlying my approach to everything is actually removing stuff from my life i think rather than trying to add systems and add processes remove things once you can get clear on what's essential and non-essential or what's important to you and not um, not so important to you. It really gives you some structure around what you tend to focus on. And we, we are never going to do everything perfectly. Like let's go back to that expectation management. For example, for me, I actually don't care about ironing clothes or even folding, you know, folding up kids' clothes, for example. But some things that are really important to me might be, I really want to put, um, proper stuff in the lunchbox, for example. If, I, if I'm filling the whole lunchbox with pre-made snacks, I feel bad about that. That's just me. So if you know yourself and you know where you can take a shortcut or a cheat, you know, like a cheat sheet, know that and use that um, to make things easier. So you're taking stuff away from from your, your life rather than, well, I have to be the perfect housekeeper. I have to be the perfect cook. I have to be, you know, the, the perfect um, mother at getting the kids to every curricular activity that they want. Figure out what's important to you and then take away what you don't want. A really massive thing, and I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to condense this because it's, it, it's a whole conversation in and of itself. You need to readjust your relationship with time. Now, in the past, they used to talk about time as... I'm sure everybody's seen that, that quadrant, the urgent and important and not urgent, not important. You put your tasks into the quadrant and you focus on those that are urgent and important. No, what you can talk about is multiplying time. 
So people say, oh no, you know, that's, that's just not a nonsense. You're blowing my mind. How can you multiply time? The way to multiply time is to create systems in your life where you ask yourself today, what's going to save you time tomorrow. So, so like, um, like compounding interest is, is to money, creating systems for your time is very much the same thing. So as I said, you know, sorry if it's, it sounds so crazy, but, and I would like to talk about it in a bit more depth, but a, an example to try and illustrate it. I can do quite a lot of things pretty well, but one thing I never got on top of was the washing. It would be on the couch. It would be in on, it, you, you name it, there'd be washing there. So I thought to myself, okay, I have all these plans like, okay, on Saturday, I'm going to get the washing done. And then fine, I might've got it done, but by Sunday morning, I'm back to the same situation. So I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm honestly living my life on Groundhog Day with this, this washing. So what I did was I had to think, what can I do instead of sitting there folding it on the Saturday, what can I do to make it that on the Sunday, I don't have to do it. So a really um, obvious thing occurred to me was, well, if they don't have the clothes, they can't wear as many clothes, they can't dirty as many clothes, they can't wash as many clothes. And then if they need them, they have to go to the washing pile to get them rather than just go, oh, well, there's some more in the cupboard. So the washing pile was never getting put away because nobody had the urgent need to go to the washing pile. So I got every single item of clothing in the house, put it on a table, divided it up into all the different people. And I basically thought, well, what can fit into one drawer? So, you know, those big nappy change um, tables, it's got eight, eight drawers on uh, four and four nappy change on the top. Now, all the, the clean washing is on top of the nappy change drawer. And if it belongs to you, again, I haven't got to the point of folding or ironing or anything. I take it with my hand and I put it into a drawer underneath the top of the nappy change table and that's it. If your clothes don't fit in the nappy change drawer, they get put in a box and I put them up in the top of the cupboard to rotate, you know, if someone tears a t-shirt or whatever it might be. Uniforms, okay, I keep, keep, obviously got to keep spare uniforms, but for everyday um, clothes, I've just got rid of them. I've just said, I need to make a system that will buy me more time. And by eliminating the problem, which was the total, you know, oversupply of clothes, I've now got a system where is if, if someone's wanting clothing, they've got to go and get it themselves off the top of the, the drawer and either wear it or put it in the drawer underneath themselves. So it's about what can you create in your life to save you more time tomorrow? And for me, that, that I'm hoping symbolizes or, or, or explains what I mean by uh, multiplying time. You've just changed my life. Like literally, <laughs> I am just thinking that that is exactly, I'm like, I only have two kids and I do washing every day. And I thought I was being super snazzy that I would put the washing on in the evening, set the timer so that it would finish in the morning so I could hang it out and then get the day going. But you're right. Like, they don't need as many clothes as, oh, my gosh. Okay, can you please, can you please give me another one of these examples again? Like, you're about to uh, welcome child number six into your um, what seems to be super cruisy life you don't even see uh, any wrinkles on your forehead on your, on your okay forehead. I, don't know if the, I, I don't know if this is going to um, hit home with anybody because sometimes as I said it's a simple small things but I've had a lot of situations where I'm about to walk out the house and someone will knock over a glass and it will break on the floor and I've suddenly got to pick up glass or they'll knock a bowl and the bowl suddenly shattered everywhere and oh god everybody don't move because you've got no shoes on and you can't be trusted strap her into that chair while I get this glass cleaned up and I'm supposed to be somewhere so what I did was everything now is um, like melamine plastic type of bowls so any any child who is is wanting a vessel to either eat out of or drink out of, too bad, sorry, it has to be plastic. Adults can sometimes occasionally go into the special cupboard and get a proper glass. <laughs> but what I just did was, and you know, it's a very small thing, but I'm just trying to put the idea forward is, I looked at what was causing the problem and tried to get rid of it. So the, the problem was I, could, I can't clean up quick enough after you. I can't get those breakfast dishes cleared. I'm not, I'm not um, in a position to remove every single plate that's left over on the table. So what I can try to do is harm minimization. You drop it. It's not going to crack everywhere and I'm not going to spend like 20 minutes trying to clean up glass. 
just small things that have to be very personal to, to your life and to how, you know, you've you got to look at where you're spending your time or where your massive annoyances are. I try to operate from a, a principle of, of zero tolerance. So I'm not trying to fix, like, I'm not trying to fix over a problem. I'm trying to totally remove it from ever happening again. And it, it's better for my stress. It's better for my overwhelm. But also, it saves you so much time because you're not doing the same thing every time, which is fixing the problem. You're just getting rid of it. Uh, you know, this is a, another example. Forcing kids to go to sports or activities they don't like. Um, I spent a whole lot of years doing that. Now you don't want to go. Fine, you, we're, we're done. I'm not. I'm not forcing you, but understand that this is the last sort of opportunity you've got. And if you don't want to go, then I'm not going to force you. How much time? How many arguments? How much, you know, bribery to get in the car because we've got to be there at a certain time? That's one really good thing that's come out of the pandemic. I think for a lot of people, is it's made it's made us see for ourselves, but also for our children, what do they actually want to do? And do they miss it or do they, I mean, you know, some of my kids are absolutely, the, without the sport, they were just desperate for it. But other things that they, they would do, they didn't care. They weren't fussed either way. So why am I spending the time and the effort and the money forcing, not forcing them, but thinking that that's what they should do or that's what would enrich their lives when it's, it's only stressing all of us out? Yeah, that's really interesting because that's been a big takeaway for my group of friends who... Um, have said exactly that like i spend my life being the taxi doing all of these things but i'm the one who signed them up for it and after just watching the kids in lockdown who are actually really um clever at entertaining themselves and that's free and that requires zero driving and carting around of children um but yeah, just reining it back in. Look, I, I had a very tough love mother and we were allowed to do one extracurricular activity a term and but there was none of that. If we didn't like it, you got dragged kicking and screaming because I have parted with my hard-earned yeah. cash to, uh, yeah. to pay for you to go to that, so you are going. But then again, if there was the dummy spits, you literally didn't get to do that ever again and that was, yeah. that was you done. Oh, my gosh, Bailey, like... That is next level. I'm really, really, <laughs> really, um, imp really, really impressed with those, like the clothes, holy hat, that literally. Well, happened. you know, you do the same thing with the toys. The, the, the kids that are prepared to pack the Lego away and stay in one place with it, they can have Lego, but all other toys have to be bigger than my hand so I don't like step on it and crunch it under my foot and get stabbed by sharp little barbie legs or you know anything like that everything has to be quick and easy to pack away I don't want tiny millions of tiny little things and again the kids don't know any different yeah. if they have like a box of you know I don't know 10 or 15 toys to play with they don't know that there's like two or three other boxes up in the cupboard. They don't miss it. So rotate them. You know, people are always passing that tip around. Um, bring a small amount of toys out, pack the other ones away, and then they get the chance to go choose some new ones. They think you're the best in the whole world because you've got the new toys or they've got something new to play with, but it's just seeing it with fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, it's tied in with the, the consumerism. We have so much stuff that's actually burdening us and it's overwhelming us. Try to try to reduce some of the stuff as well and you'll go a long way to um you know re reducing the overwhelm yeah, that's so interesting because that strategy of when like you sort of you're removing the the issue or the problem before it even begins like i know with our business i do a lot of things where where it's repetitive tasks i find that if i'm doing the same thing and it's not something that really me with my managing director hat should really be doing i have got into the process the the pattern and the the routine now of i record my screen me talking to the camera doing the things but then we store it in our internet and someone else can do it. That task does not need to be done by me and I remove it. And I'm good at doing that at work, but that's a really, I've always spent trying to get this blend thing better that I do a lot of the focus on, um, on trying to streamline the work side of things. And I've sort of just like treated the, the the home stuff as like okay well this is you just want this because this is how home goes so yeah. that is a very big takeaway for me today is that 
that same attitude I really and those those systems and processes need to be getting applied to the the home life mm. as well just um just to put the word out there because you know we've talked a little bit about how words are important just remember that if we're not blending it we're bleeding so there's a work-life bleed if there's not a nice blend it's a bleed and if you if you've got a, a um a weak boundary you're going to have bleed between it so it's exactly what you're saying and you know you've, you've just presented an an excellent example of how you multiplied time you recorded yourself doing it once and you've bought yourself time down the track because you don't have to explain that to anybody again sometimes we can feel guilty being working you know working parents and trying to have a family and a career so why not take the best of your working skills your working strategies and systems like you say and apply it into the home and then you can get the benefit from it. And then it can kind of sometimes when you're having those moments of thinking, oh, you know, I should be, I should be a better parent or I should, you know, those expectations that we have and when we start to feel guilty, say, well, working's actually helped me because I've developed skills that I can now apply and put into the home to, to benefit all of us. Oh my gosh, I'm going to round it out on that because praise be to that i feel like a beautiful <laughs> a beautiful way to um to finish off um bailey thank you so much that was really fabulous and i hope everyone watching and listening has got some really great takeaways from that um very 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 impressed so thank you very much for that you're, you're very welcome just don't be surprised if you only ever see me and uh, my kids in the same clothes <laughs> I love it. And drinking out of plastic drink bottles when they're 18 <laughs> years old. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.